Integrating absolute value functions can be a little bit intimidating, but it's really not that bad. Here's the general strategy to integrate the absolute value of a function. To integrate the absolute value of f of x from x equals a to x equals b, what we have to do is split the integral up along the x-intercepts of f of x, because that's where the function could switch from positive to negative, which is important since we're taking absolute value. And once we split it up, we just need to make the negative areas positive, because that's what the absolute value would do. And we basically have to do that manually, and that way we can just drop the absolute value bars and integrate the function in the usual way after we split it up. Here's a little picture, right? I've got this green function, f of x, and over here I have positive area. So from a to c, where the area is positive, I can just integrate the function. I could just drop the absolute value, no problem. But from c to b, the area is negative because the function goes to the negatives. And so for that part, from c to b, we have to negate it because it's already negative. So throw in an additional negative, and that's gonna make the area positive. And when we include that negative, we're able to get rid of the absolute value bars because that's exactly what the absolute value bars would do. They would hit this with a negative so that it reflects back to the positives. Now let's try a couple of examples, beginning with this one. The integral of the absolute value of two x plus four from negative three to zero. To compute this integral, we need to figure out where 2x plus 4, the thing inside the absolute value bars, switches sign. And in order to do that, we need to figure out where it passes the x-axis, because that's where it could switch between positive and negative. In fact, this is an upward sloping line, you should know, 2x plus 4 is a line that goes up. So wherever it hits the x-axis, it's actually going to switch from negative to positive, right there. So we need to find where this happens, that the line hits the x-axis. To figure that out, of course, we'll just take 2x plus 4 and set it equal to 0. Then we subtract 4 from both sides to get that 2x equals negative 4, and then divide both sides by 2 to get that x equals negative 2. So it's at x equals negative 2, where 2x plus 4 switches from negative to positive. And again, we know that's where it switches from negative to positive because we should know that this is just an upward sloping line. So it's going to be negative over here, and then right at negative two, it's gonna hit the x-axis because we figured that out, and then it's gonna be positive afterwards. So now we split this integral up like this. The first integral goes from negative three, which is our starting point in this definite integral, and it goes up to negative two. At negative two, that's where the line hits the x-axis, and that's where it switches from negative to positive. Now, from negative three to negative two, this line is negative. It's taking on negative values. And so the absolute value function would hit it with the negative, which is why we have that negative there. By putting the negative there, we have enacted the effect of the absolute value bars, and that means we can get rid of the bars because all they do is give us that negative. At negative two, 2x plus four switches from negative to positive. So the rest of this integral is from negative two to zero. Remember that zero is the upper bound of this definite integral, so that's where we stop. Now, between negative two and zero, 2x plus four is positive. So we can just leave it all by itself, no absolute value bars necessary, because it's positive that whole time. All that remains is a straightforward definite integral computation. Let's say we take that negative out of the first integral, and then integrating 2x plus four, we get x squared plus four x, which needs to be evaluated from negative three to negative two. To integrate that, of course, we just use the power rule in reverse. Similarly, to integrate 2x plus 4 over here, we get x squared plus 4x, and this needs to get evaluated from negative 2 to 0. So evaluating this part on the left, we can plug in negative 2, which gives us negative 2 squared, which is 4, plus 4 times negative 2, which is negative 8. So when we plug negative 2 in, we get 4 minus 8, which is negative 4. Then we have to plug in negative three and subtract whatever that is. When we plug in negative three, we get negative three squared, which is nine, plus four times negative three, which is negative 12. 
9 minus 12 is negative 3. And remember, that's the lower bound, so we have to subtract that. And of course, out front, we still have that negative that we pulled out of the integral. Now, moving on to this part on the right, when we plug in the upper bound of 0, we just get 0, and then we have to subtract plugging in the lower bound. When we plug in negative 2, we already saw that you get negative 4. So we have 0 minus negative 4. Then just do the arithmetic. Negative 4 minus negative 3 is negative 4 plus 3, which is negative 1. Multiplied by a negative is positive 1. And then plus positive 4 is positive 5. So that's the value of this definite integral. And here's a graph of the function without the absolute value bars. What the absolute value bars would do is take this part of the function, which is negative, and hit it with another negative, reflecting it up to the positives. So of course, that's why we hit this with a negative, so that that area, instead of being negative, became positive area above the x-axis. Here's one more example where we have a quadratic. We're integrating the absolute value of x squared plus 2x minus 3 from negative 4 to 2. We have to complete this in a similar way. We need to figure out where this function inside the absolute value bars passes the x-axis, because that's where it could switch signs. So we take the quadratic expression and set it equal to 0. Then we can just factor this. 3 and negative 1 multiply to negative 3, and they add to positive 2. So the correct factorization is x plus 3 times x minus 1. And then by the zero product property, we have the x-intercepts as negative 3 and positive 1. And then we should know that this is an upwards-facing parabola because the leading coefficient is positive 1. So it looks like this, roughly. And so it must hit the x-axis at negative 3. And then it becomes negative, right? It's going down underneath the x-axis. And then it comes back and hits the x-axis again at 1. So between there, negative 3 and 1, it's negative. But everywhere else, it is positive. Again, we know this because we know it's an upwards-facing parabola, so this must be how it hits the x-axis. This tells us that when we split up the integral, it's going to be this part, from negative 3 to positive 1, that we have to hit with a negative. So here's what that looks like. The first integral goes from our lower bound, negative 4, to our first x-intercept, which is negative 3. The function's positive over this interval, and so we don't have to change it at all. We can just get rid of the absolute value bars, and there you go. Same thing with this third integral, which goes from 1, the second x-intercept, all the way to our upper bound of 2. The function's positive there as well, so we can just drop the absolute value bars. Like we said, it's between negative 3 and positive 1, the two x-intercepts, where the function is negative. So to get rid of the absolute value bars, we have to multiply it by a negative, because that will make this positive, and we want everything here to be positive. And now all that remains is some tedious computation. Quickly talking through the details of this computation, the negative in the second integral, just like before, we're going to take out of the integral. So every integral has the same thing inside of it, just that quadratic, which by the power rule, we can integrate to a third x cubed plus x squared minus 3x. In this first bracket, we're evaluating it from negative 4 to negative 3, right? Look at those bounds. And then in the second one, we have that negative that we took out, and we are integrating it from negative 3 to positive 1. And then in this last one, we're going, of course, from positive 1 to positive 2. So now we just have to plug and chug. Beginning over here and plugging in the upper bound of negative 3, negative 3 cubed is negative 27. Divided by 3 is negative 9. So we have negative 9 there. And then plus negative 3 squared, that's plus 9. And then minus 3 times negative 3, that is also plus 9. Then we have to subtract what we get when we plug in the lower bound. Plugging in negative 4, we have 1 third times negative 4 cubed, that's negative 64 over 3. Negative 4 squared is 16, and negative 3 times negative 4 is positive 12. Now onto this set of brackets, when we plug in 1, we just get of course 1 third plus 1 minus 3, and we see all of that there. Then we have to subtract, plugging in the lower bound of negative 3, but we already plugged in negative 3 over here. That was the first thing we plugged in, and we saw that it equaled negative 9 plus 9 plus 9, which is just positive 9. Now that resulted from plugging in the lower bound over here, which is why we are subtracting it.
Finally, moving on to the last set of brackets, plugging in 2, the upper bound, gives us 2 cubed, which is 8 times a third, so 8 thirds, plus 2 squared, which is 4, minus 3 times 2, which is minus 6. And then we have to subtract what we get when we plug in the lower bound of 1. And we already plugged in 1 as the upper bound in the second set of brackets. We saw that it was a third plus 1 minus 3. So we are subtracting a third plus 1 minus 3. Finally, we simplify, and I use some mixed numbers here just so that the fractions didn't get super big, and in the end it's 15 and one third, which we could convert to an improper fraction for a final answer of 46 over 3. And here's a picture of what the function looks like without the absolute value. You can see that this part here lies below the x-axis, so that part would get hit by a negative. That's what the absolute value function would do, which would reflect it across the x-axis so that it is positive. And so all of our area would be positive. That's of course why we had to hit this second integral with that negative. That's representing this negative area, but by multiplying it by an additional negative, we made it positive. So that's how to compute definite integrals of absolute value functions. If you want some more practice, consider supporting Wrath of Math by becoming a channel member. You can get early and exclusive access to additional videos, including another video where we do three more problems like these, including an integral of the absolute value of a cubic function. Also be sure to check out my Calculus One course and Calculus One exercises playlists in the description for more. Thanks for watching. Audio.